Well, Merry Christmas, everyone. Oh, what a year, right? Like it's just, it's so nice to, to be in this time of Christmas and I just love Christmas. It's, it's really, it's just this beautiful time of year where people seem to just not be able to help but talk about Jesus. I mean, Target and Starbucks are playing songs about Jesus being born and celebrities who would never darken the doorways of a church are singing hymns about Jesus. And I get it. I'm not naive. There's a commercialization of Christmas, but I, I, I still think that God gets the last laugh as it seems that for, for one month a year, from Starbucks to the Pentatonics, from speakers embedded into bricks and celebrities with hearts of stone, the rocks are crying out to sing, no king, but Jesus. Friends, this is just one of the, this is one of the biggest seasons in the, in the, in the year of like the church calendar. But in, but in a post-Christian city, like Chicago, I think actually this is the one big Christian season of the year where people are more open to learning about King Jesus than they will be for the next 11 months, in part because they're face to face with Jesus everywhere they go. <laughs> Christmas songs, Christmas trees, Christmas mangers, Christmas lights, Christmas parties, and Christmas greetings like Merry Christmas. All of them remind them of King Jesus. And so do the other ones. I know we have like the whole war on Christmas thing. So forgive me if you're part of that. Uh, but like, people, people get all up in arms about happy holidays. Don't, don't, don't get up in arms about that church. Happy hol holidays literally means holy day. That's what, what, where it's coming from. They're saying happy holidays. They're right. These are holy days. Amen to you. They want to say season's greetings. Guess what they're trying to avoid? Merry Christmas. Friends, like it, it's, it's all around us. We're just trying to avoid it. Who cares? The message of Jesus is everywhere we look in this season. And so the question that I think each of us have to answer and every person in our culture has to answer is how will we respond to the greeting of Christmas? That's also the question I think we, we see answered today in the text that we're looking at as a young woman named Mary is faced with the first Christmas greeting. And I believe as, as, as we see her response, I think it should inform our response as well. So I wanna hop in the text. Again, we're gonna be in Luke one, but would you pray with me as we, as we start? Would you pray for our message? Would you, would you pray for, for this preacher <laughs> that I would be faithful and uh, that, that we would hear God's word today? So Father, meet us now. Lord, Christmas is all around us. I know there are some in this room uh, who the Christmas greeting uh, is one where they're like, yeah, it's just Christmas. It's the thing we do in December. We say Merry Christmas. For others, Christmas is the reminder of, of our Savior and King. And for so many in our world, it's just an excuse to, to have parties and give presents. But we pray, Lord, that we would think more deeply about this Christmas greeting this morning. Lord, that we would, we would grow in our understanding of what it was that was communicated to Mary and we might better understand the beauty of her response. Speak to us now, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So our text begins in Luke 1, verse 26. If you have your Bibles, you can find, them, find that on page 855 in the Bibles that are under the chairs or up in the bookshelves. The text begins by saying, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, if you're new to this book, the author is a man named Luke, who is compiling an investigative report on the life of Jesus. He's conducted uh, numerous interviews and done research, verifying accounts to put together this document that, that we've called the gospel according to Luke uh, that was commissioned by a man named Theophilus. 
And so regardless of your personal beliefs about Jesus and Christianity, we need to recognize that the author of this book, at least the author himself, is writing with the understanding that this is history. That is the perspective that the author is coming to the text with, which is why when it, when it comes to, to Christmas, we sing historical songs. Like today, just a few moments ago, we sang one of my favorite hymns. It's actually the, one of the oldest hymns uh, in the Christian faith. It goes back to the seventh century. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here. It's not just a historical song. It's a song about history as the people of Israel were held captive by the Romans and longing for Emmanuel. They were waiting for God to deliver them. God with us. You see, Christmas is, is situated in history. And I know there are some, uh, some will ask, well, was Jesus actually born on December 25th? Well, probably not. It's not that big of a deal though. Uh, but, but, but we do need to see that, that even the date, even the date for Christmas, December 25th, is based on a third century attempt to be historical. You see, the text that we're gonna be looking at today is sometimes called the Annunciation. It's the, that's a fancy way of saying the announcement. It's the announcement that the angel Gabriel came to Mary and said she was going to be the mother of Jesus. And actually throughout church history, the festival of annunciation, which is the, the moment of conception, was celebrated throughout history on March 25th. And according to Jewish uh, understanding of that time, it was often believed that a prophet, a true prophet, would die on the day that they were conceived. Is that what happened? Were they, was he really conceived on March 25th? We don't know, but that was the belief. And therefore, it makes perfect sense if a prophet is supposed to die on the day that they were conceived, then March 25th would be that perfect time because Jesus died during Passover, which would have happened around March 25th. So the early church fathers, what you find sometime in the fourth century, uh, sometime in the third century, all of a sudden are saying, well, you know, if, if Jesus was conceived, if the Feast of Annunciation is March 25th, what's nine months later? December 25th. Now, nevertheless, there are those who are gonna claim that Christmas is actually pagan and that December 25th was an attempt by the early followers of Jesus to, to Christianize pagan holidays like Sol Invictus, the, the winter solstice. But the, the, I'm, I'm just here to dispel that. Uh, serious historians, my friends, don't actually believe that. They don't, they, they don't believe that because before, four, before the fourth century AD, uh, no one celebrated Sol Invictus at the end of December. It was always celebrated at the beginning of December. And it wasn't until Emperor Julian, uh, the Roman Emperor Julian, who really was struggling and angry at Christianity, that all of a sudden the date was moved to December 25th. And so most serious historians who look at kind of how the church interacted with the, how the church, early church interacted with the world would say that it seems a lot more likely that the Roman Emperor Trajan, uh, the Roman Emperor Julian, forgive me, uh, would have moved the date to December 25th than Christians who were trying to do everything in their power to avoid paganization or be close to pagan ideas would have moved it to that date. So I'm here to defend Christmas, people. <laughs> I love my Christmas. All this to say, Christmas is deeply steeped in an honor for history and historicity. And for this reason, Luke begins this section of the gospel by giving historical specifics. Look again at verse 20, 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. You see, at six months, Elizabeth is coming to the end of the second trimester of her pregnancy. If you weren't with us last week, then you may not know that Elizabeth is the wife of a priest named Zechariah. We'll talk more about this in a bit. Uh, but Luke is simply just giving us a time frame here. Again, he wants us to see that Christmas is history. It was at this time that God had sent another message for the angel Gabriel to bring to someone. In the section right before this one, Gabriel told Zechariah that his wife was going to be pregnant. And in the book of Daniel, we actually see Gabriel explaining prophetic visions, making this the third time that Gabriel is mentioned in the Bible. This time, 
coming to someone in the town of Nazareth in Galilee. Nazareth, a small podunk town where no prophet had ever come from and is not mentioned even a single time in the Hebrew Bible. And our text says that Gabriel, the angel of God, who spoke with the prophet Daniel and then the priest Zechariah at the temple went to this small, unimportant, one traffic light town to speak with someone who would have been thought of as just as insignificant as the town that she was from. Look at verse 27. He came to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Hear this. The angel Gabriel went to a young woman, likely between the ages of 15 and 19. The text doesn't tell us uh, her exact age, but that was the typical time in which someone would, would be engaged. And it's a, it's a patrocentric time. When you lived with, your lineage was traced through, and your home was led by your oldest male relative, which makes it truly astonishing that God sent a message through an angel to a young woman. I mean, even the, even the early church recognized that that was a scandal in and of itself. In, in Jewish courts, a woman's testimony was not even trusted at this time. So to, to say that the angel went to her, you don't make that kind of thing up. It's based in history. Once again, this is something that you'd want to hide. But it's important to recognize as, as well the juxtaposition here. You see, Gabriel first goes to an important city, Jerusalem, the capital, in an important place in the city, the temple, to talk to an important person, a priest, a man about his wife becoming pregnant. And now he goes to an unimportant city in an unnamed, unimportant place to speak with a young woman who holds no important rank or position. You see, one of the things the Christmas message is meant to communicate, even right here, is that the Christmas message is not meant for the high and mighty. It's not meant for the lofty, but for the lowly. It's a message for those like Mary. See, for the next two weeks, we're actually gonna be doing a little bit of what we might call Mariology. We're gonna be studying a little bit about Mary in these next two texts. And my hope is that we'll better understand actually how to respond to the Christmas message from this matriarch of our faith. So let's look at her response, verse 28. And he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. Now, I, I don't enjoy critiquing Bible translations, but here I go. Now, hear me, hear me. This is a 2000 year old document and our translations of the document are trying to help us understand it uh, in the best modern English while honoring the history of translation. So I'm not saying this is a bad translation. It, it's really, it's really not. But I just don't think it's as exact as it could be. You see, the angel says to Mary, greetings, O favored one. And I realize that this might make some of us think that there's something special about Mary, that she was more holy or, or righteous than others. But the text actually doesn't say this. It would be better to read this greeting as greetings, O graced one. You see that word in the ESV, trans, that the ESV translates favor, is the word charis, which means grace. And the way the verb is used is meant to say that she was a recipient of grace. She would have heard this greeting then, not as a commending, oh, oh, graced one, as though you are so full of grace, but rather, oh, one who has received grace. Not commending, but conferring. Interestingly, Zachariah and Elizabeth aren't conferred, they're commended. Again, one of those juxtapositions we have to notice. And in Luke 1, 6, it says, they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all, this, all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Not so for Mary. There's actually no mention of her character in her introduction, only her marital status. And so when she hears this greeting, that she has been given grace, 
she's troubled. Because one of the things we just have to reckon with is that gifts have implications. Do you recognize that? Like your gifts have implications. Husbands, this is why it is wrong to buy your wife a treadmill for Christmas. I mean, if on Christmas morning, I open my presents and the first gift that I open is Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, I might politely say, thank you, think about it a little bit and then put it aside. But if the next gift I open is a one-year subscription to Weight Watchers, I get the message. I'm overweight and obnoxious. You see, Mary hears that she has been gifted grace. And so she's troubled and tries to discern what kind of greeting this might be. In the original language, it says that she logizomai, what kind of greeting this might be. And I know you're like, oh my gosh, all the Greek. Just, just hang on with me for a second. The reason I bring up the logizomai is because it's actually the word that we get logic from, logit. Do you see that? It's, it's logic. She's trying to figure out what's going on. You see, we in 2023 suffer from what the, what the British novelist C.S. Lewis often called chronological snobbery. The belief that 2,000 years ago, people were less intelligent and just so gullible. It's this belief that that results in people thinking that, that they have to turn, uh, that to have faith, they have to turn off their brains. But that's not the case. You see, when Mary sees an angel, she doesn't act like it's normal. She begins to reckon. She reckons with the angel's appearance and with the angel's words. I imagine she's thinking things like, am I dreaming? Am I being punished? Did I eat something weird? Should I run? I mean, angels are kind of scary. Did you notice how uh, throughout the Bible, anytime an angel appears, people bow down and the angel says, no, 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 don't worship me, like chill out. Like this would have been a scary experience. And I believe though that, that Mary's response of reckoning should be ours as well. And so my first question for us this morning as we look and we hear the Christmas greeting is have we reckoned with the implications of the Christmas message? Have we discerned Have we worked out the logic and considered what this message actually might mean for us? That the God of the universe is offering grace. Friends, if the God of the universe is offering grace, it means that we are in need of something. It means that there is something wrong with us. Friends, saying Merry Christmas is another way of saying you're broken. You have a need. There's a reason to be merry, but you don't have it without the Christ in Christmas. It means there's something wrong with us. When Mary hears the message of grace, she's afraid because she knows that she's a sinner. So the angel actually has to say to her, do not be afraid. You see, when she's encountered by the angel of the Lord, she's forced to reckon with everything she has been told since she was a child that there is a greater spiritual reality beyond us, that there is a glory greater than us that we do not measure up to. She'd heard these things and likely believed these things to be true, but now she is face to face with that reality. The Christmas greeting is a greeting we are meant to reckon with because it means that we are smaller and needier than we know. Let's keep looking at verse 30. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. Again, meaning she was afraid. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Again, we can unpack the words of the angel Gabriel. He can tell Mary's afraid and once again uses that word charis, grace that we mentioned earlier. She has found favor or grace with God. Again, it's not a favor that that she's earned. Charis is a gifted favor that we often call grace. And so she has found grace with God. Verse 31, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So here it is, the big announcement, the annunciation. Mary is going to be the mother of Israel's new king. 
I mean, it's easy for us to miss how theologically packed that statement is. I mean, first off, his name is Jesus. I mean, that's, that's the Greek version of his name. Mary probably actually never called her son by the phonetic name Jesus. Uh, she likely called him Yeshua, which we might say in our context, Joshua. You see, for the angel to, to say that her son's name should be Jesus, Yeshua, Joshua, was to say that he was going to be a mighty warrior like Joshua, who, who led God's people to take ownership of the promised land. He will be the son of of the most high. This is another way of saying son of God, something that the occupying Roman, uh, Romans believed was true only of Caesar, that Caesar was the son of God. But Gabriel makes it clear that this one to be born won't simply be a king who is thought of as, as having some divine blood. His father is the one true God, the one who the Israelites prayed to when they said, Baruch Atah Adonai, Melech Olam, blessed, O Lord, O God, King of the universe, Son of the Most High. Yes, it's a statement that speaks to Jesus's divinity, but to Luke's audience, it also spoke of Jesus's political supremacy. When saying he was the Son of the Most High, it was like saying, Mary, there will be no king but Jesus. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign forever. His kingdom will know no end. Friends, this is what the people of Israel were longing for. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the son of God appears. Friends, it's, it's from Isaiah. O come thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to flight. O come, thou key of David, come and open wide our heavenly home. Make safe the way that leads on high and close the path to misery. Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. You see, this is what they longed for. The seed of David who would reign forever. Mary's finding out she is going to give birth to this Messiah, to this King, to this anointed one. But Mary's got some issues with this. She has to ask a question. Verse 34. So uh, how will this be? since I'm a virgin. You see, Mary goes from reckoning to seeking understanding. This isn't blind faith. She wants more information. You see, believe it or not, Mary may live in a simple podunk town, but even simple people know where babies come from. How will this be? I mean, she knew of the process to create a baby, but she didn't, know the process. Her mom gave her the birds and the bees talk, but her knowledge was all textbook. Now it's important to recognize though that the difference in what Mary asks as opposed to what Zechariah asks, right? Zechariah, the priest of Jerusalem, when confronted with the angel says, how can I know this? Like, how, how can I know this to be true? Whereas Mary asks, how will this happen? Zachariah's question says, prove it. Mary's question says, explain it. Tell me more. You see, because of Zechariah's question, he's struck mute. But because of Mary's question, she's given details. You see, as Pastor Nathan said last week, Zechariah shows us that God will work despite our doubts. But Mary... Mary shows us that God will honor your questions. Friends, as you wrestle through the Christmas season, some of you are like, oh, I just don't know what I believe about this whole thing. God can handle your questions. He wants you to come with your questions. So my question for you, for us, is have we sought to understand the Christmas message? Have we sought to understand 
this, this Christmas greeting. Maybe you understand the implications of what the message is saying about your humanity, but have you explored the mechanics of it? The concept that in Jesus, God came to earth as a baby. I mean, you see, when we understand the Christmas message, we understand that it is completely inappropriate to call God the man upstairs as though he is uninvolved in our humanity. In Jesus, in the Christmas message, God is the one who came downstairs to live with us. Verse 35, look there. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. You see, when she asks, how will this happen? I'm sure that Mary's thinking in part like, okay, so you're saying that like once, once Joseph and I, like we make this thing a fish, right? Like I get both rings, we're good, we do our thing. Like then this is gonna happen. Uh, Joseph's gonna be like, okay, it's weird that you came to me instead of Joseph, but like, I get it. And he's like, uh, no, Mary, you're pledged to be married to Joseph, but, but this will not be Joseph's baby. Through the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit, who in Genesis 1 hovered over the waters and by the power of the Most High, who spoke creation into being, a new creation will come to life in you. Who like Adam was created by the will of God, not the will of man. Yet he will be conceived in Adam's daughter so that he is fully of Adam's line, fully human and fully God. I think the, the English novelist, uh, Dorothy Sayers, said it best when she, when she was wrestling with this idea. She said, for whatever reason God chose to make man as he is, limited and suffering and subject to sorrows and death, he had the honesty and courage to take his own medicine. Whatever game he is playing with his creation, he has kept his own rules and played fair. He can exact nothing from man that he has not exacted from himself. He has himself gone through the whole of human experience from the trivial irritations of family life and the cramping restrictions of hard work and lack of money to the worst horrors of pain and humiliation, defeat, despair, and death. When he was a man, he played the man. He was born in poverty and died in disgrace and thought it well worthwhile. Mary, you want to understand? You're going to give birth to God. It's for this reason that the historic church fought over this title for Mary, mother of God, not the originator of God, but the, but the mother of God. You see some in the early church argued that they said, no, 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 we shouldn't call her mother of God. We should just call her the mother of Christ saying that Mary only gave birth to the human part of Jesus and the divine part came later. But Gabriel's explanation won't allow for that. When Mary bore a son, she gave birth to God in the flesh. I mean, from peasant girl in Podunk, Nazareth, to mother of God, you've come a long way, Mary. Zechariah seeks proof and is told, be quiet and watch. Mary seeks understanding and she gets assurance. Look at verse 36 with me. Even Elizabeth your relative is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month for no word from God will ever fail. So we need to recognize how ridiculous this would have sounded to Mary. You know, we often assume that Elizabeth was, was Mary's cousin, but the text doesn't say that. It just says relative. And because she is older, there's good reason to think that Elizabeth may have been Mary's aunt or her great aunt. Mary knew of poor Aunt Elizabeth, who never had a child. And so this news, we have to recognize, because I, I, I don't think we get it, because we just, we think miracles in the Bible are like, yeah, 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 it happens. But this news is the equivalent of turning on the television to see Oprah Winfrey, who is 69 years old, or, or Meryl Streep, who is 74 years old, going on national television to let us all know that they're six months pregnant. Like, you would giggle, right? This is, this is the assurance that the angel Gabriel gives Elizabeth, uh, gives Mary. Elizabeth is pregnant. So you can know that no word from God will ever fail. You see, the story of Elizabeth wasn't new either. 
the history of God's people has seen this story repeatedly as the matriarchs of the faith, Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel, each suffered through infertility. As the poet Kina Aragon has said it so beautifully, they experienced this reminder in cycles like infinite loops of the same death sentence, you will never be a mom, period. Always period, never a comma, no exclamation. But apparently periods are not periods in the hand of God. As life soon swam inside their song, echoed history's halls, and Mary's mouth, the Magnificat, filled the mother of Messiah. You see, what, what Kina Aragon is saying is that from Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah, Hannah, and Elizabeth, God has regularly shown his omnipotence in the midst of impotence. And through Mary, he shows his omnipotence in the midst of impossibility. You see, Mary reckoned with the Christmas message. She sought to understand the Christmas message. And lastly, we see her surrender to the Christmas message. Look at verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Now understand, after the angel left Mary, they did not begin erecting statues in her honor. A choir director did not commission the Ave Maria to commemorate the Annunciation, and towns all over Europe and Latin America did not rename themselves Santa Maria. When the angel left, Mary was still just a peasant girl. But now she was a pregnant, unwed teenage peasant girl. Yeah, she was pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit, but let's be honest, who's gonna buy that? And in this society, when you're, when you're engaged to someone and you're pregnant, this could have meant serious legal consequences. Engagement was not just a, a diamond ring and a promise. Like for, for us, we do the legal stuff when we, when we actually get married, but in this society, the legal stuff was done at the engagement. Like th that's where it all started, which is why Joseph is considered so honorable. We see in the gospel of Matthew when he says that he's going to divorce her quietly. Nevertheless, even if he did, there was no Chicago for Mary to run off to where being pregnant and unwed is thought of as eh, NBD, no big deal. You see, when Mary says, I am the Lord's servant, she was surrendering herself to a life of being misunderstood, mistreated, and misrepresented. And the reality is, this is not very appealing to us. We tend to use all sorts of cliches when it comes to situations in this vein, don't we? We say things like, God won't give you more than you can handle, or you're never more safe than when you're in God's will. These cliches are comforting, of course, but, but they're not true, not necessarily. You see, God will often give you more than you can handle <laughs> so that you surrender to him. And just because you are in God's will does not mean that you will be safe. I mean, Jesus literally said in the garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but yours be done. And in entering the father's will, he was arrested, beaten, and executed in one of the most painful ways imaginable for our sake. See, Mary was not safe in God's will. And she was definitely given a lot more than anyone can handle alone. And still, she says, I am the Lord's servant. You see, when we use those cliches, I think what we're, what we're often saying is the exact opposite. Not I am the Lord's servant, but the Lord is my servant. We say, oh, well, God would never allow this or God would never do that. And as we say these things, what we're saying is that if God did allow or do that thing, then he would not be faithful. He would not be good. He would be a traitor. But friends, that, that makes God our servant 
instead of us, his. That's not the response of Mary to the Christmas greeting and the Christmas message. No, Mary surrenders to the, Christian, the Christmas message. And we likewise have to ask, have we surrendered to the call of Christmas? You see, the call of the Christmas greeting is to follow him, to call him, to call him Lord in ourselves, his loyal servants, to pledge allegiance to the king who is seated on the heavenly throne, who hung on the bloodied cross, whose head was laid on the bristly straw in a manger and who developed as an embryo in the virgin's womb. Would you surrender yourself to that embryonic king and him alone? Friends, would you, would you look to no king but Jesus? So you're gonna go about your week now and you'll hear this greeting again and again. Merry Christmas. Will this just be another familiar greeting to you? Or will you with Mary discern the greeting and respond with her as your guide? Hear those questions again. Have we reckoned with the implication of Christmas? Have we understood the mechanics of Christmas? Have we surrendered to the call of Christmas? For Mary, she did all three and received the greatest gift of all, a gift available to us only if we will reckon, understand, and surrender our Savior and King. No King, friends, no King but Jesus. Would you pray with me? Lord, we seek to surrender to you. You are our King. Help us, Lord, to, to hear the words of Mary and the words of the angel Gabriel. Father, we pray that we would respond. We would respond as Mary did willing to enter into what the rest of the world might call foolish, unbelievable, impossible. Lord, help us to embrace the beauty of this message and to share this joy with the world. We praise you now and we rejoice in the opportunity to sing to you our King, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.